so we got uh, quite a few people joined already. Uh, welcome to this uh, new webinar. I will explain that my voice is having some limitations today. So uh, as a good thing for the audience, I won't be speaking that much and I will allow these experts to share their thoughts. Um, this uh, webinar, it's about uh, how much BIM uh, can or is or will be transforming the industry. Everybody that I know talks about BIM in a way that it makes me believe that BIM has been on earth since the beginning, since the dawn of mankind. And so there is one way of understanding BIM for every person that I've come across. So today I invited these three um, very well known for me and very savvy in BIM experts, uh, Lucrecia, James, and Hag. And as a way of introducing or beginning this webinar, I would kindly ask you guys if you wanna make a quick introduction about yourselves. And then I will start with some questions. Is sure. it the part right? Yeah, it's uh, we don't have this rehearsed, so maybe let, let, let's let's uh, let's make make Lucrecia the first one. Okay, thank you. So, Hi, everybody. Yeah, uh, I don't know if there is someone speaking. Okay, well, thanks everybody to join this webinar. Um, I'm Lucrecia, I've been with Corvis for almost 15 years, so I almost uh grew with BIM and the, and the company. I'm also a, a, an architect. Um, and well, we started with BIM, I don't know, like 15 years ago at the company, uh, building all the standards and creating all our templates and our workflows. And we have been like um, researching about BIM and working with it since then. Um, I, I love like uh, all the technology and and all the, the the new apps and things that are coming up and how this uh how beam is changing the way we we work and the the way the aec industry uh, it's evolving so uh, that's you. that's it you're welcome so james maybe you want to go next yeah thank you martin uh excited to be here and and, and you know this been with some other amazing uh colleagues uh, my name is James McKenzie. I'm from the San Francisco area. Um, I have an undergraduate degree in construction management and a master's in architecture. Early in my career, I worked on the construction side for some smaller as well as very, you know, international level construction companies. And after about 10 or 12 years in the industry, I transitioned to being an owner's rep because I was more interested in the bigger picture of project delivery. And uh, got subsequently got my master's degree in architecture because I was as an owner's rep, you're heavily involved in planning and design, you know, even selecting the architectural firm and the design team, going into construction and facilities operations. And I was really interested in the whole continuum of all those different phases. Uh, but along the way, I discovered early in my career that I was kind of a, a, a technology geek. I was very good with computers and just figuring things out and really determined that this is going to be the future of construction and, and architectural design. And when I was getting my master's degree, I was challenged by one of my faculty advisors to write up on collaboration and, and technology, how that affects the AEC industry. So that's when I first started getting my hands on BIM in the very early days. And um, since then, I've been working with startups and doing a lot, you know, pro project projects that use, have, use heavily BIM. I also work for Autodesk as well, where took my knowledge of BIM to, you know, it was a quantum leap. So. Excited about where the industry is going. We still have a long ways to go, but I'm here to learn, to you know, talk and also to listen to others. <clears throat> Appreciate that. Harag, this is your turn now. Yes. Uh, so my name is Harag Jerovadinian. I'm an associate principal at Onyx Architects. Uh, we're out in Pasadena, California. Uh, been with the company for off and on about uh, 15, 16 years. Um, I have about 17 years of hands-on Revit um, experience. Um, seen a lot of projects uh, completed through the door um, all the way through the CA process. Um, I'm primarily involved in QC and, and uh, drawing production here at Onyx, uh, making sure everything uh, is in line and uh, 
you know, goes out the door the same way. Um, I'm originally from Toronto, uh, went to University of Toronto out there, uh, decided to move out to uh, Los Angeles area uh, about 17, almost 18 years ago, um, and uh, jumped to a bunch of jobs, uh, ended up at Onyx, um, you know, left, came back. Uh, so it's been it's been quite a journey. I've had a lot of uh, revenue experience with a lot of, uh, you know, different team members. Um, <laughs> like to, I like to educate, um, you know, all the players involved and uh, teach them how to properly use the program um, to make sure uh, we don't run into any hiccups. And uh, very happy to be here. Uh, thank you for the Corbett team. And look forward to uh, continuing this webinar. <coughs> All right. See, <clears throat> sorry. So, one of the first things that I noticed is that every person that I come across <clears throat> does share some level of a personality. And so, my first que my first question to you guys, and this is very personal. So it's about you guys um, in your 10, 15, almost 20 years of developing these uh, skills in, in BIM and in understanding <clears throat> the initial power of BIM as a drafting tool and the evolution into such a sophisticated thing. What would be the top, I want to say two, three, maybe even up, up to like five skills youth in retrospective, you think you acquired or you developed by, you know, by approaching your career in BIM? Well, if I may start, uh, I think that that BIM has like like <laughs> two very strong components. One, it's like a, a kind of a soft part or soft skills, yeah. and the other, it's more technical. At the beginning, we thought that BIM was just using a tool using technology or or drafting uh but um with the years we 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 knew that it was not just that it it, it means a lot of um collaborative work it means leadership it means communication uh you need to have like um obviously like a very technology driven person you need to be like very curious in order to move forward and to being top of the of the technology uh but for me it's both things like soft skills but also like hard or technical skills nice i wrote collaborative for me, curiosity <laughs> for me i'd say uh, the top skill is uh, really fine-tuning the coordination process uh, the, the three-dimensionality of of BIM has allowed us to really foresee issues that might be problems later on. Uh, whereas in, in the AutoCAD days, uh, you might cut a section and, and you know somebody will fudge something or a number or a dimension and um, it all looks fine on plan. Um, and then when you get out on site, you have a real big issue. Um, I think BIM kind of resolves that. Um, particularly when you use it uh, in collaboration with MEP and structural um, Revit software, um, assuming the consultants use that kind of thing. But even so, um, it, it's kind of ironed out a lot of, a lot of little long-term issues, saved everybody money, um, you know, saved the architect time, which is money, saved the owner money and construction costs and change orders. Hmm. Um, you know, it's been a real great hmm. tool in that, regard um, and to really help help everyone visualize everything dimensionally. All right. Um, maybe Rag, if, if I don't know if you're picking the uh, microphone like from the computer, but if you want to get a little closer, uh, maybe that I can hear you, but right there. Um, so James, in, in your experience, because you you know follow this path, what do you think were the skills you acquired along the way? Well, I think, you know, my education really helped me a lot having this kind of big difference between a construction management degree and an architectural degree. Um, but also pr on a practical basis, when I was in college, I learned 
architectural drafting in hand. I'm probably a little older than most of you, so I actually learned hand drafting, and I was fairly good at it, although my lettering wasn't very good, so that prevented me from getting an A. But I liked doing it. It really helped me understand the design and how to build it. So it was a great mental process. But then when I got out of college, my dad bought a computer and he bought some CAD software and I realized, whoa, this is so much better. And it changed my whole outlook. It's like, well, technology, I think, there's gotta be a better way to improve things. And along the way, I realized working on the construction side and later becoming an owner's rep, that really it boils down to three main things, process, people, and technological tools. And if you don't have all those things, you're really kind of wasting your time. It's easy to go out and buy a lot of software, to buy a robot to go lay out your, you know, construction site. That's the easy part. But if you don't have the people in the process, you know, that's really where a lot of firms, I think, miss the opportunity. <clears throat> and, and, you know, for instance, if you buy the BIM software, but you have no one who's capable of learning it quickly or using it in an optimal way, you're in trouble. Or if you find someone who's very good at say something like Revit, but they're not collaborative, they don't like sharing, they're, you know, uh, a control freak and, you know, they're kind of toxic personality. It's, I think you guys talk about this at your pro project management um, meeting a couple of days ago, it brings poison to the project. So it really takes executive insight to really look at all three of those things before you even like go on your BIM adventure. I mean, that's one thing I learned. I mean, I've had to improve my personal, my leadership skills, my technological knowledge, and, um, you know, un and understand process, you know, especially mm -hmm. on the construction size, we have a lot of processes to go out and build something. Architectural mm -hmm. designers working with their engineering experts have a lot of process. So our, our industry is driven a lot by process. And yet a lot of our processes come from the Middle Ages in some cases. But we have to understand how other industries improve process. If you look at technology companies versus how we do things in the a AC industry, they're way ahead. Even the medical industry, how when you go to a healthcare facility and you're checked in, they have totally different processes for what you need to do. So we need to learn from other industries how to improve our process. So those are the three things I think I've learned in my career that helped me improve. About that. All right. And so you're, you're kind of like stepping into my next question, which is, and much like yourself, you know, we all come across different companies, right? And um, we have helped a number of companies doing what? Where... I was surprised how many times somebody said, well, we already bought the computers and we already have the software, but it has failed miserably. So we're looking for somebody that can help us make it work. My point being, it's been already, I, I would say we can agree, it's been 20 years of the whole beam conversation, right? In different layers. Are we making real progress towards Beam having a real true added value, like anything from, are we delivering a design more proficiently and with, uh, with a lower cost? Like Craig was saying, are we actually, are we effectively making clients save money or are we still struggling with processes or whatnot from one to like a hundred? What would you guys think it's the actual value that Beam is, is adding today? I think it does um, add quite a bit of value. I'd give it, I've it somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 85. Um, you know, as far as uh, money savings for the owner, I think it does a really good job of doing that. Um, the questionable part is, is it saving money for um, the architect? Um, and I think James touched on that, uh, where if you have the program, doesn't necessarily mean you're going to execute it properly. You need a team that knows how to do that properly and mm -hmm. Revit is a bit of a tricky tool it's a I mean I, I say Revit because that's that's the platform I've been using for BIM but you know let, let's just say BIM is a it's a great tool but you really know need to know how to use it properly uh, you know there's several ways of doing several different things with the same outcome but some might be more labor intensive some might cause more issues in the long term 
there are easier shortcuts. You might have a team of people where some people have, uh, you know, a great deal of experience and know how to use the sophisticated tools. And you might have half your team that's just beginning. And some of those tools and those processes might confuse everybody and really cause a mess. Um, uh, you know, I've seen, I've seen it go both ways and you have to be careful who you put on what project for what reason and to do what type of output um, and and the individuals that are not very seasoned with the program and the software might cause you more you know long term problems trouble if you will um, and, and and loss of time to get that product out hmm. So maybe James, in your experience, because um, what Hrag was saying is my point, <clears throat> we can save some time in delivering the drawings, but what's, what's your perspective on the real value that it's actually adding, not the promise of the value, that's my point. Right, and, and I think it's, you know, I, first I'll maybe talk a little bit about the architectural side and then other in the construction side, because, you know, they both have risk, but the risk is much different, especially in the United States here. Uh, very quickly, on the architectural side, I think time-wise to produce a similar set of drawings, whether you're using CAD or a BIM, you know, like a Revit, from what I've read and, and talked to people, it's about the same amount of time, but the capability of having much higher quality uh, construction documents is, you know, in a BIM environment. You know, the whole idea is to reduce change, those ugly things we call change orders, RFIs, you know, get those big <coughs> design errors out of there during the design phase, not in the construction, because we all know that's, a, that's, that's dangerous to have big change orders during construction. Um, mm -hmm. So the promise that it was going to be the time, the design time is going to reduce, I don't think has materialized yet that I've seen. Um, but at least we have now have the capability of having much better design documents using different tools. But with that said, it also requires process in project delivery. So I design build or design assist, having a builder on board to help work with architects is also a big step forward. You know, I've seen some incredible collaboration between construction companies and architectural firms where the architect can produce some drawings, maybe not as detailed as they normally do for like a low bid environment, but has all the information a contractor needs. And again, some guidance and some good input on products and constructability and other things that really also contributes. You know, and that's kind of a separate thing from BIM, but the BIM creates the environment for collaboration that allows that to happen because of its 3D nature and its emphasis on data. So that's on the design side. On the construction side, I think contractors have made more progress in a way from, from architects because I think they've taken on more of a risk. You know, contractors take on a huge risk, but a contractor will also spend a lot of money to buy a tool that reduce, that improves their productivity. For instance, buying a bulldozer or a crane. Contractors have a lot of experience with, with risk where in the United States, architects risk is much different. The level of standard, totally different. Mm. So I think contractors to their benefit have taken a risk, bought a lot of tools, they experimented, they tried things, some things worked, some things didn't, some people worked, some didn't. And they kept evolving quickly and methodically to see what works for them. I mean, I just talked to a very large, the VDC manager of a very large construction company who's had over 20 years of BIM experience and they said they're still struggling, still trying to figure it out. So it has a long ways to go in the construction, but on the other hand, it has helped them reduce risk. It also helps them, um, you know, for instance, at a trade level to have information, like, you know, the big picture architectural design, but also allows you to have just a single little sheet or detail that a carpenter or a concrete, you know, uh, a mason can quickly look at, say, oh yeah, that's the information I need. You know, having a 3D visual helps, but also having just a plain old 2D, old school floor plan, just showing the information they need to lay out their work or to do the work helps. So there's a lot of flexibility in it. And I think that's helped contractors quite a bit. So the promise of it has gone a long ways, but also what I see is a lot, you know, it's more with the larger construction companies that have the resources <clears throat> to hire and do training 
it's the smaller construction companies, you know, what we call the mom and pop size, that are struggling because they don't they they don't have the sophistication, the res access to resources, in some cases the finances to do this. There's a few, but I think they're lagging behind, and that's that's where the big promise hasn't hit yet. It's hit the big companies because they're the ones that go to Autodesk University. They've got a lot of resources, a lot of knowledge, but you know they can move much quicker. Whereas the smaller firms are struggling, and and I think maybe on the architectural side that might also be the case. But I've worked with a lot of smaller firms that are very sophisticated at BIM users because mm -hmm. they're nimble. They've got some great people and leadership, and they can move forward quicker. Kind of like connecting the two, and I hope you can still hear me. Um, one of the things is that when I see that just the architect was using Revit, but like Craig was saying, but there's no MEP, there's no structural, no civil, and, and there's nobody putting it together, then, then it's not really BIM. And it's around really producing the savings that, and, and Craig, I was gonna ask you back and then look, you can add your, your view here, but are, do you guys think that clients, like, like owners or developers, do you think they already see this or they're still like uh, reluctant to believe that even if it costs a little bit more money on the design side, that that James is the connection is, it's not making design so much cheaper or faster, but you you even make want to spend a little extra dime there, but you're going to spend a dollar. Yeah, sorry, you're going to save a dollar later. Um, I don't know, my, my point being, do you still see a lot of projects where just the architect is on beam, but not the consultants, and then the value of beam, it's a little diluted? Real quickly, if I could just interject, right. because I, I was an owner's rep for several years. Yes, some <clears throat> spectrum of the sophistication of owners is broad some will I, I actually would hire a firm because of their BIM capability as well as a contractor and I would hook them together and have a great outcome but not all owners were like me some could care less they just want the best price maybe you want to deal with them anyway but yeah. to your point too that contractors are taking they can take an architect's BIM model and add to it and do all the mechanical electrical plumbing coordination and really have a valuable set of information. And unless an owner or the contractor takes the initiative, it's probably not going to happen. So having a, a great architect BIM model without, you know, the added, the downstream stuff, it's BIM light, you know, it's yeah. not, it's nice. caffeinated BIM is the other way. But anyway, that's just my, my take on it. I like the decaf, decaf BIM. <laughs> so look at it. I know you've worked with so many, <clears throat> sorry, different markets. What yeah. is your, your view on this? Well, I, I couldn't agree more with, with all of you, I must say. Uh, what I see is that we still need a lot of work to do in like in working collaboratively, like using IPD, for example, as a, as a way of uh, gaining more um, efficiency or uh, seeing more benefits on, on the use of BIM. And the other part that I, I think we are all missing, it's like the eye of BIM. It's it's like just nowadays, it's becoming more, I won't say popular, but everybody's talking more about that. And it's the, the data is getting maybe easier to work with and to connect because uh, at the beginning it was like just, just some disciplines were working with that data and it was really difficult to connect between the other disciplines and now well technology the technology is evolving and now it's it's easier to to get uh, new software and new ways of connecting those data and and also including like uh, artificial intelligence to to get uh, like uh, analysis or 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 or, or get more tools to 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 improve this. I I think we are like kind of half a way um, of where we should be or where we are um, expecting to be. And if you guys now had to say, in your view, what is the biggest un undelivered promise? I always hated the Autodesk marketing team because they were making so many promises that then people would think that you know the software which is magically do a lot of stuff in your experience when you when you deal with this project you have to deliver you have to push them through the door 
what is what is what will be the biggest like shortfall? Where where is there any, or do you think the shortfall is more on like James was saying, more on like the people side? I think the technology might already be there, but if you had to say in your view, one undelivered promise from BIM, which maybe connects, let me just say this, connect with what 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 would be in your wish list for the next five years? What would you like to see? If you want to answer one or the other or or both of them, what would you say? Look, let me let me start with you now that you're there. I think like like we are missing like the processes. It's like um we are not 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 there yet. And um I think there are like too many things out there and we were told that it was like magic, it was easy. We can get all the information in the same place at the same time and, and seeing everything like in real time. And that that's not that true. Maybe in the future, but not now. Uh, you need to, to have like a lot of processes in place. You need to um, have a very solid team working with that and be very consistent and it's it's not magic and it's uh and it's still a lot of things on the technological side that still need to be like developed and we are all growing with that but it's definitely it's not magic and it's not all the information like in the same place and mm -hmm. so easy to get do you do you guys remember there was a <clears throat> sorry a mckenzie report 2015 saying that the aec industry was the the lagger of all industries in technology adoption. Mm -hmm. And so today it feels there's too much outside and curating and deciphering what to use and going back to crack, then you can, or James, the same thing, you can buy computers and software a lot easier than you can get people that are good at using it and a lot faster. And of course, even at, at some point, a lot cheaper. So in your view, uh, Hrag, maybe if you want to say, what's your, What's your undelivered promise or what's your biggest wish list in, in the adoption of BIM as a true operating technology? Or, or I look at it always tells me it's not a technology, it's a methodology. So I'm gonna use the word methodology. What would be your view? So I think, you know, it, it kind of, you, one of your questions translates into the other. Um, I think my biggest wish list is for, let's say a developer or a contractor to actually use BIM to coordinate their own kind of processes as opposed to just falling back on the floor plans provided. It's like, well, you know, let me provide you with the BIM model so that you can dissect that model, create your RFIs. Maybe, you know, there's answers there that has been resolved from an architectural and engineering standpoint but there was no section through the wall, for example. And, uh, you know, somebody down the line missed providing the section through the wall. You don't know where the slab is. You can't see it anywhere in, the, in any of the plans, but it does exist. Now, if the, if the contractor had that in hand and was able to manipulate the model um, as needed, then you would cut out the middleman of the time wasted on the contractor's end, on the architect's end, on the engineer's end, saving money for everybody. Obviously the contractor is the one that's gonna make all the money here, but you know, at the same time, they need to meet you somewhere halfway. Um, now, all of that said, that is entirely dependent on a bulletproof BIM model. If you don't have that in place and it, you know, it's really messy, me as an architect, I'd be hesitant to hand that over to the contractor who would use that against everybody. So let me, um, let me pin on that, Greg. sorry to interrupt, but James, <clears throat> I know you have a long list of wish items, but let me, let me get another angle from you at this precise moment where we don't have Ross on the call, our good friend, Ross Spector, a lawyer from San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And Greg, you're inevitably putting a foot on the means and methods and liabilities. If you deliver a model, and, and James, you, you, you've seen both sides of the street. As an architect or a consultant, you build a model. If you wanna truly coordinate, you have to step into the means and methods. You have to start laying things where they are supposed to go, which is already telling the GC how you are instructing something. Is there a possibility, like Hag was saying, 
that the consultants can deliver the team on a for your information only so that at least you as a consultant are delivering to the owner a well-coordinated model, even if the GC later decides to do something different. But what happens if they decide to do something different and they break the coordination you had done in the software, you know, during design? What's your view on the legal impact to make this thing that Craig is saying a reality? Yeah, and I'm certainly familiar with, with that scenario. So a couple of things here. It all depends on how you're going to deliver the project. You know, if you're in a low bid environment, you know, classic American low bid, where the arch you hire an architect, you have one contract, you or a contractor or a separate contract, and there's like no coordination between those contracts. It's like, you know, there's really not nothing legally requiring those two to even like coordinate. So that's the worst case scenario. And you know, the United States has had that for a long time. We're trying to get away from it, but it still exists. But at the end of the day, the architects required by contract and by professional standards to deliver a fully coordinated model if they're using that. Now, if you look at what the AIA has done now, they've got a whole new set of consensus documents that help guide the architect on what it, you know, what are the deliverables and the level level of quality and standards, which which is very helpful. So at least if you're not doing a delivery method that integrates design and construction, you can at least have a very what we used to call in construction a clean set, very biddable set. And the way you know you have got a clean set of documents when the bids come in, they're all like within you know a two to five percent of each other. You know you got some good design documents. So there is still a lot of benefit to using bid and BIM, even if you're in the low bid environment where you don't know if the contractor will ever use your model at all, but at least there are some gauges that <laughs> So that's that, one, that's the one to Let me just, <clears throat> sorry, let me point out that the two, two to 5% Delta in the bids as a measure of the quality of the set. I had not heard that before. I think it's a great lag measure you know you will know it once it's done but i'll keep that i i you know i i did a lot of estimating and i was involved in bidding so i've learned sort of you know what to look for and that's one of the gauges even back in the cad days or even hand you know hand drafted we would call them clean documents they're well coordinated well drafted well thought out now in the other extreme once you start integrating design and construction like i mentioned earlier that changes everything. It's a paradigm shift um, because now, you know, you're working collaboratively with the builder during the design process, not necessarily right at the start, but once, you know, the architects really, you know, probably late schematic design, early design development. If you have a builder working with them, you know, it's not so much that you're telling them what to do. They're, contractors are receptive. I mean, if you tell them, okay, this is, you know, your footprint of the building and you want the columns here, you know, they're not going to necessarily challenge you on the design. That's not their role. They're there to help you build it better. Yeah. A, what, yeah. What a contractor wants is a constructible set of documents. But the really good contractor, if you look at the DPRs and some of the really Mortensons of good firms, they have people that have a lot of design experience. They hire architects as like these bridges between the architect and the contractor. They know how to design, but they also want to collaborate with them. So they invested heavily on bringing in these, what I call the bridge builders, these architects that can work with you know, the design team and helping them produce a better set of documents. And that's a win-win for everybody. And there are some very savvy owners out there who want that environment, they encourage it. And also to answer your question, it, you know, what if they pay a little more for that? There are owners that will pay more because at the end of the day, they, they know their project will get delivered on time. They won't have the same level of change orders. And also there'll be, it could be a reduction in the life cycle cost. That's all part of it, but you have to, in order to get those, to gain those things, you have to have an integration between the design teams and the construction team. It's the only way it's gonna be achieved. Interesting. So- <clears throat> Yeah. So the, the thing is, <clears throat> do you guys think that there is, there is room for, I think, Craig, your point was a world with one model. Like, why is everybody building their own model over and over and over again? Um, 
in your experience, and maybe Luke and Rag, you can add to James. Uh, have you seen any any will to to get the model delivered from like the design to the pre-construction at least as a way of helping the next one in line do their job better? Uh, you know, I haven't come across that just yet. That's kind of why it's on my wish list. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, it is a bit of a struggle right now because it's, you know, the contractor is not dealing with it singularly by themselves. They have a lot of subcontractors and they would need to be on board in the same regard and, and, and all, you know, there's so many facets to it that, that, you know, we only can scratch the surface of from understanding, you know, just as architects, you know, based on, you know, the limited time we spend on site and talking to contractors or whatever it may be. Um, so they have a lot of different processes. I mean, I can give you a countless number of times where a mechanical set of plans has been handed to, the mechanical subcontractor and when you go talk to them on site they have no architectural plans anywhere to be found and you know it's like well you know the architectural plans have you know dozens of you know notes and keynotes that are in collaboration with the mechanical engineers plans that will allow the contractor and the subcontractor to deliver this thing properly so if you fail as a contractor to see all those additional notes as a full set of plans, then I'm not sure what good it's going to do. Um, it, you know, if, if you can't all see eye to eye on that, hmm. um, you know, there, there's that little bit of a struggle there and, you know, it's, it's part of the architect's job to ensure that's all coordinated and, and addressed. And, you know, you go on site, you catch some errors, you, you let people know you have your reports and not, you know, all the fun stuff that goes along with the, construction administration process right um and you know that that's really how how i learned as as an architect how to really produce a set of plans ready for the contractor and what they're looking for what's important um you know just talking to them and just being really upfront and and, and honest with each other um and i've made a lot of great friends in the construction industry um you know, very easy guys to talk to, and and I've learned a lot from them as to what they need to see. I mean, there's, you know, I can't tell you how many friends I have in the construction industry that tell me, you know, don't give me standard details. Nobody looks at them. You know, mm -hmm. the, the subcontractors know how to build a soffit. You know, you don't need all that miscellaneous info to fill the gap. You need to really figure out, you know, <clears throat> is everything going to fit? Is it? Is it? properly coordinated? Do you have all your systems working properly? Do you have any loose ends that aren't tied up? Um, so, you know, that again, that, that is something I, I, I'd like to see um, is probably more architects being hired by um, contractors to get into BIM models and, and control all that. And I think, uh, you know, going back to what you said, Martin, um, you know, is there a way to control, hey, I handed you a BIM model to the contractor, how do I know they're not going to manipulate that model and do something else and claim that it was the way it was? Now, I'm sure there's something that can document that and, you know, pin that in place and then really catch any issues yeah. after the fact if, if something's been, you know, tampered with. So hey, my good friend in, in common with James uh, Ross, the lawyer said many times to me, nothing will prevent bad people from doing bad things. So at some point, yeah, you got to trust uh, the person that you're working with, the company that you're working with. And, and as we approach the last uh, 10 minutes, I, um, I did want to ask maybe, Lucre, you have helped a number of companies, BIM or Revit. And so for everybody, but maybe you want to start, Lucre, if, if a, if a comp, and, and, and this is the big trick, when we say implementing BIM, in the, it's a two-fold question. Implementing BIM, does it make any sense talking about how the architect will use Revit? That, that's number one. And if, if it only makes sense implementing BIM when you're talking to the client so that the client will push it down and make sure everybody's using BIM. So for the sake of my next question, let me dream of the scenario where a client as an early adopter wants to push BIM 
throughout the complete team and they want to implement BIM the way we are discussing BIM to be meant to be, like all the consultants, a collaboration platform, one where the owner is involved in the design process by accessing the models and the general contractor is brought, brought on board early. If some company or a project, a developer or an owner, it, it's about to implement BIM that way. And they talk to you guys. And I want the three opinions before I go to two small questions and a little game. What would be the one thing you would recommend that owner to be mindful of if they want to embark in such a mission? Did, did the question make sense the way I framed it? Yeah, but I, I would go back to what James said at the very beginning. I think it, it, it has like three parts, that, which, which are people, processes, and technology. These are the, the two, three. May, probably people, it's the, the, the key thing here because processes, I won't say that they are easy to build, but they are not that hard and technology, Technology, it's quite easy to get, but the thing is the people. You, yes. you need to get the right people with their right skills and because otherwise it won't work. Um, and this is a collaborative work, not, not just in, in terms of, of the architect or, or the disciplines, it's, it's um, by collaborative, I mean uh, the owner, the the, the GC, the architect, everybody, they, they need to work like in a kind of IPD way in order to make um, the project successful. Thank you. James, do you want to go next? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't agree more with Lucrecia and the rest of the, uh, the panel. Um, I mean, really what it boils down to when you think about it, is all the stuff that can go wrong during construction can all be resolved during the design process if you have you know the builder and the designers all working together all the processes all the details everything that's needed can be resolved i mean the famous was it the McLean curve shown by the former ceo of hok patrick that was one of the most powerful graphs i've ever seen and that tells you the whole story right there of how mm -hmm. our industry should be operating but the reality is we're not there yet. I mean, most projects are fragmented. You know, the design is separate from construction. And until we fully integrate those two, we're still going to be struggling. There's still a lot we could do. It is a progression. You know, we still need to get good drawings out, even if the contractor isn't involved. So it's like a stepping stone. But that is truly, once our industry kind of can make that our normal way of doing business, our industry will be much more efficient. We, have, we still have a long ways to go. And that's why, we, Martin, we need people like you evangelizing throughout the world <laughs> because there's still there's still a lot more opportunity. There is. That's a lot. I agree. It's a huge opportunity. Yeah. So we're, we're getting close to the end. Uh, Rag, if a client owner wants to do this and they talk to you, uh, what would be your one like recommendation? Um, I would recommend to get the right team on board. Um, you know, a, a BIM model that isn't properly drawn is, can be a real disaster for everybody. Um, you know, I think, I think it, it's such a precise tool um, and it, it has a lot of functions that, that could go wrong if it's not controlled properly. And, you know, I've seen it happen countless number of times. Um, and really, you know, to, to answer the question that, that Eugene has posted here um, for transitional um, firms that are focusing on them, you really need to focus on educating your staff um, on use of them and, and properly using it and, and just the how to. Um, really, you can model everything. I can model it down to the screws and the drywall if I want to. It, you know, if we had the proper fees for that, we can go ahead and do that and coordinate all that. But the reality is that, you know, that's not, that's not cost effective or efficient for anybody. So there's, you know, there's, there's the methods of getting to the same results um, in ways that is easy for all to understand, regardless of skill level. You know, you got to keep it, keep it simple. You know, the, the, there's a saying, keep it simple, stupid, right? Yeah. Um, there, you oh. know, there, there's a reason for that is you don't want to overcomplicate anything. 
So, I mean, we don't have a lot more time. The whole cost effectiveness, I think we could do a webinar on just that. How much is really a cost effective level? So let me let me ask you um, guys, because I, I want to ask you two more questions. I mean, actually three, but we got to be very, very sharp and very fast. Number one is everything we're talking about spins around the beam manager, the guy that will orchestrate all this. So if you have to go out there and either find it yourself or recommend someone something when they're looking for that person, and I want you to just say three words when I pose the question is, what would be three like skills or personality traits or things you think they should know? It could be Revit per se or Dynamo or something else that you would say, these three things are things I would most certainly check before I onboard somebody as the beam manager. Three things, make it fast. Technical skills would be one of them. Just construction know-how. I think that uh, you know, you're, you're essentially building a building um, three-dimensionally as they would um, on site. So you gotta understand how everything goes together. Uh, you know, that, that's one of them. I'd have to think about the other two. Um, <clears throat> you know, another one would be precision and accuracy. All right, you got, you got the three. This is not where you can say, I want a junior person with 25 years of experience, right? No, no can do. <laughs> so uh, three things, Lucre and three things, James, you would, you would most certainly recommend somebody to say, check on these things. Uh, that you would search for this person in charge of being the BIM manager, the person orchestrating the implementation of the BIM methodology in a project? I think I would say like the ability to anticipate that that would be one and to have like a very like kind of a strategic mind. Uh, that's another one. Um, I agree with her about the, the construction and, and I will also add like the management. I, I think those like are the three ones all right james yeah very quickly i think your project management seminar answered two of the big questions i mean it's yeah. leadership and communication mm -hmm. by far and then third is domain expertise in bim you know you have to have you have to have it's non-negotiable if you're still doing hand drafting or still in cad then you're not the right person but finding somebody with all three of those is difficult all right. Yeah. So not that easy. Yeah, not that easy. But you know, leadership can be developed, communication can be developed, domain, technical skills, they they can all be developed. But so, you need to find someone with the willingness to do that. All right. Um, I'm gonna ask you, I'm gonna give you two options, and I just want you to tell me which one would you prefer if you had to implement BIM as a methodology for a project. Design bit build or design build. What was the first one? That design bid build, more like the traditional, like you finish your design, you go bid with two or three general contractors and then the awarded firm will build or the design build approach that, that is kind of like you pick a GC and an architect that will work together from design onwards. Can I choose IPD? You can, yeah, all right. I would, IPD would probably take us a little bit more to the design build environment. Probably, yeah. Uh, James, what, what would you say? Well, naturally, I'd, I'd gravitate towards design build, but you know, IPD, it's, that's a progress. That's like your first level, you know, IPD, mm -hmm. you, you got to start with design build and just get better at it. So anything that integrates design and construction together is the starting point to optimize BIM usage. All right. Uh, may I ask uh, something, Martin? Yeah, of course. Have you ever worked in a like fully IPD workflow or project? That's for you, James. I James think. or Hart or whoever. Uh, I haven't personally. I've known. I know some people. DPR and an owner from uh, Sutter Health. They were one of the big. Yeah. Uh, drivers of IPD and it's a much, but everybody was handpicked. And they struggled at first, but 
it all worked out. But you have that's where you have to have an, the owner really needs to drive all this. And there's very few owners still out there that have that capability. So until that happens, I think IPD is not going to go as fast as we would like. I will. I will have one webinar about IPD. It, it's it's a whole thing. But uh, I want to hear Rag before I do my one last questions, and we do this little fast game that I had prepared for the end. So Rag, in your opinion, if you had to go more traditional design than bid than somebody builds or integrating design and build, what would be your recommendation? Ideally, a design build, um, but in most of my experience, it's been the other way around. Been the other. All right. And so, I mean, we're so pressed with time. I'm going to skip the question where I wanted you guys to share. I, I, I mean, I think we can say, you know, have you heard of this? Um, I'll say the fuck up nights where people just tell their bad stories about how things were bad. I would have loved to hear your your bad stories. I mean, we have I know I have a lot uh, with Lucre. We have shared a number of stormy projects. <laughs> so. When, when Rag was saying a bad team can do a bad thing inside a model and that can put the whole team in, in trouble. I would say my biggest fear has, was always to get stuck down the road. And once you have the pressure of the project in your shoulders and you're stuck with the technology or the people, then you find yourself in, in trouble. Um, but we don't have a lot of time. And so somebody was asking, how do we suggest to, to train people. I think that's a whole other webinar about how uh, I think, Rav, you were saying at the beginning, your job is to take more like the junior people you hire and build them up as a, as a you know, savvy, solid, uh, rapid person. So I'm going to share this little exercise that I want to do with you guys. Um, I call it the skill uh, market. Let me know when you can see my screen. Oops. Can you see the screen there? All right. Mm -hmm. So I was just taking some notes when you were talking uh, about these uh, skills that, that we wanted in the in the um, um, in the beam manager. So I will also ask everybody in the crowd today to vote one, two, three, four, five, six. If you had money to spend, so Lucrecia, Hrag, and James, I will give you a hundred coins to spend training your beam manager in one or all or some of these skills. And I want to know how much money you would spend training, you know, your beam manager in each one of these uh, skills. Again, we don't know the context. We don't know the uh, a theoretical exercise. But I would also like everybody to just give us in, in the group chat, like one, two, or three, or four, or five, or six. Where would, if you have to pick one, in the audience, just tell us which one would you pick? And let's get going with you, Harag. How would you spend 100 coins training your BIM manager in any of these six uh, skills? So 100 coins combined through one to six? Is that what? I mean, you can you can spend 100 in the technical know-how if you want, but you only have 100. <laughs> it's not a lot of coins. You only have a okay. Yeah. I get it. Um, I'd say... Uh, 35 and number one and two, both. Um, communication is about 10. Management, probably 20. Oops. All right. James? Well, uh, you know, I've gone over there, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, like like if you spend five more, you're you're out of budget. We we, we don't want to do that. So, uh, James, so, uh, if you, I'd give three and four at least ten and take it out of um, management you, and uh, technical know-how. So how do you want to go? So thirty there. Now I have 15. I think strategic mind will probably take 10 and anticipate five. All right, good. James, how do you spend your 100 coins? You're, you're mute. Uh, it, it still happens. Let 
So I would go for leadership and communication 25 each. Um, for construction and design experience, I'd go 15 each. So that gets you what? 30 total, you know, what I call your domain experience. <coughs> and I would, the, the balance I would divide between, sorry, my, I moved my screen. Um, strategic thinkers are extremely important. A project needs strategy. We need more leaders like that. I mean, I kind of tie that into your management capabilities, but let's sit, since it's separate here, um, let's split whatever the difference is. We're at 50, 60, yeah. 70, 80. Yep. And be able to anticipate problems. You know, I call it your radar capability. You know, oh, yeah. you see the problems coming at you way before they actually show up. That's very important in project management. All okay. right. Look at how you spend your... I would say 20 to strategic mind, uh, 20 to management, and 20 to uh, construction know-how. No, sorry, technical know-how, and then the rest uh, would be evenly. So, okay, we're gonna do 40. Sorry uh, for the math. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, I'm gonna ask Eugenia if you can, if you can give me the count of, we're gonna give each vote from the uh, audience one coin. And so they're counting coins now. <laughs> um, hmm. How many coins did we get for the technical know-how? One, they were very shy. One. Oh, maybe everybody knows a lot in this crowd. In this crowd. And construction know-how? Construction know-how, so far two. All right. Anticipation? One. Oh, so we got a lot more votes on three and four. All right. Mm -hmm. And so four, we got what? Five or six? Or we have eight, uh, nine. <laughs> right, we're still getting some votes. Now that people know they have coins, they're voting. <laughs> Management, uh, also very, very little shy. We got one or two. Let me, no, let me zero. check management because I didn't, I did, yes, I didn't get any. <laughs> oh. Around there. So anyway. Okay. Uh, we are getting very, very close to time and I want to wrap it up on time. Um, what I wanted to do was say, okay, how do we do, how do we see the total on the skills? I think, and, it, and we could have a very long conversation about how do we either find or build the right person with the right character and the right, you know, personality traits and, 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 and skills. It's funny when we start wishing what a person should have because we we're never going to find that person so i am happy to see that there was a bit of a, a balance between the skills that we think are needed uh, and this is nothing but a, a little exercise just to get a sense of what kind of person needs to be behind this to make it happen and being on time and trying to be very very mindful of um, the time of everybody i want to thank you guys, Luke, James, and Hag. And of course, I want to I want to thank everybody who joined the webinar and stayed. Um, as a way of thanking also, I wanted to say that we have two plugins that we have developed, which we use a lot. And those are available in our website and they were posted today for free download. So if anybody wants to go in and download them, you can download them, use them, and let them know how they work. But um, more importantly, as I said at the beginning, I appreciate uh, the time. I appreciate James Hag and Lucre sharing your thoughts. Every question that I asked opened the door for another webinar altogether. So I think we will have more of these conversations uh, down the road. I thank everybody who joined and I hope you guys took something that you can actually use. And if there's any further questions after the webinar, please send them to uh, the uh, organization. It's house at corbystudio.com. And uh, if there's anything else we can discuss, feel, you know, feel free to suggest more uh, topics uh, next week. And James, I may want to talk about this with you. We have a third webinar of this series about construction management and how the role of the construction manager 
it's a galvanizer in the industry. So I'm going to be talking to you about that too. Thank you again so much. Thank you everybody in the audience for joining. And I hope to see you again uh, soon.